Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we're officially getting into Powers of X. Really, it's like Powers of 10, I think is what it is. One of them is, I think it's House of X and then Powers of 10. I think it's how this comes out. Anyway, Powers of X basically is what it's called, or at least that's what I'm calling it. <laughs> and this, this is, man, let me tell you something. Dude, this story is really, really good. <laughs> at least this first issue is amazing. All right, so in traditional Hickman fashion, what we get is basically this kind of time chronology that we're gonna follow over the course of this series, right? If you know how to read Hickman's stories, like, if you know how to interpret what he does in the beginning, then you know how to basically navigate the waters of the story going forward, right? So we get basically year one, which is the current year right now, or the... the I guess really in the past, right? Like, you know, the, the idea of when the X-Men were first founded, essentially, which is the dream of Charles Xavier. Following that, you go into year 10, which could basically conceive or be assumed to be the present day, which is the world as it exists now. Uh, and then year 100, which is 100 years from now, the war that breaks out, and we'll talk about that here in a second. And then following that is when mutants basically ascend to their higher state of evolution. So it's really, really cool. It's, it's really, really badass. But what this does is it initially picks up with Charles Xavier just kind of meandering around and just sort of looking at things. And then ultimately he's met by what appears to be Maura McTaggart. Now, Maura McTaggart in Marvel Comics, for those of you guys who are new, and I feel like this is really kind of an important thing to explain here. For those of you guys who are new to the X-Men, Maura McTaggart is not new. She's been around for a long, long, long time. But the basis behind her is that if Charles Xavier is the instructor for mutants, which is to say the one who teaches them how to use their powers, then Maura McTaggart is a mutant geneticist who understands how their powers work. Now, the two of them often work hand in hand. And the way this played out is that she had her own group. For example, like the New Mutants, a lot of you guys have probably heard of that. If only because the movie's supposed to be coming out, which I'm probably not going to go see. The, the idea behind that is it was a, a handful of mutants that had been discovered by uh, by Maura McTaggart that she was keeping on Muir Island to understand their powers, how they work, how they function, to see if they're kind of like any significant danger. Now, with the two of them working hand in hand, what would happen here is that if mutant, if, if uh, Charles Xavier discovered a mutant who had really any, any powers that could be classified as dangerous, right? Like anything that was unpredictable or could cause all kinds of problems, and he didn't really know how they worked, he would take them to Maura McTaggart. And Maura McTaggart would analyze their powers and then give Charles Xavier an answer and then Charles Xavier would cater his teaching process around the nature of their powers right so uh, it, it's kind of cool in terms of how they function but the discussion here is Charles Xavier kind of hitting at the idea to Maura McTaggart that like he wants to create a better world now of course he doesn't reveal to her here that he has telepathy Charles Xavier kept his powers guarded for a long long time right it was one of the big things about his character the first time that anybody really learned about his abilities outside of his brother Kane Marco uh, who eventually became the juggernaut was uh, Magneto when the two of them got into a bar fight with a whole bunch of different guys and they both used their powers and they basically kind of revealed themselves to the other in terms of what they could do what their abilities were and then that kind of led to a rift later on when they had two different ideologies on how to navigate the waters between mutant and human relations but the idea behind this is it's, it's really you know more mctaggart saying hey i want to go see a fortune teller and this fortune teller came to me with a vision of sorts she came to me with the magician the tower and the devil himself and it's kind of cool to see these these things play out because we'll actually find out who these characters are so i'm not going to spoil anything right now what she tells charles xavier here where he says well you know I've, I've i had this dream of a better world and i want to create a better place and things like that and what more mctaggart says is it's not really a dream if it's real and so what this does is really seem to hit at the idea that the basis behind why charles xavier pursued uh, per pursued his dream of a peaceful coexistence is because of the fact that like more mctaggart sort of inspired him to do that but then this is when we start to learn that not everything is what it appears to be now again we're ballparking here when it comes to more we're not explicitly told as her what is kind of left to assume that it is but then she addresses him directly as Charles. And the fact that he doesn't know who she is, the fact that he's never met her, really kind of begs the question, how does she know who he is? And, he, and she says, well, we go back quite a ways, read my mind and see. And so it's just kind of like, okay. So like, it's 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 a, my it's a mystery. Like, it's mysterious. And that's the nature of, of Hickman writing, right? Like, we probably won't get an answer to that question until like, Powers of X number four. <laughs> it's, it's crazy the way the whole thing works out. Now, at this point, we basically pick up with the modern day, right? The X-Men year 10, what's currently going on right now. And this basically follows the after Math of House of X. So if you guys haven't read that story or haven't seen that video, then make sure you go check it out, right? I'll have the link down in the description, or you can go and grab the comic or, or whatever the case is for you. Uh, but basically, this follows the immediate aftermath of that, right? You know, Mystique basically showing back up to Krakoa, the, the current residence, the location that the X-Men reside in, or at least that a large uh, large majority of the mutants reside in, that only the mutants can access. She comes back
back, of course, with this with this hard drive of sorts, hands it over to Magneto, and then we get our first real display here of, of Charles Xavier. Now, again, it's not really Charles Xavier putting like the, the full totality of his power. He's just kind of there. And we really don't know the intentions of Xavier. All indications in the, in the whole tone that's being put off here is he seems like he's kind of a dick now, like he's kind of a bad guy. And, and maybe, maybe he's not, we're not really sure. But when it comes to Xavier, it's always been trying to achieve a peaceful coexistence between humans and mutants. But when you have phrases being thrown out there where Xavier says, dear humanity, while you slept, the world changed. It's just kind of like, okay. So it seems like Xavier is becoming a little more militaristic or a little more extreme in terms of pursuing his own goals. And that's kind of the crazy thing here, because as this happens, you end up having this, this, you know, sort of discussion between himself and Mystique, you know, where she says, well, we have more demands because of what it is that's taken place here. So obviously Mystique isn't really doing this for the betterment of mutant kind. And Xavier says, well, that's fine. You know, because we, we also have demands too. Like we have things that we want to achieve as well. Uh, and in this world, if you're going to live here in Kokoa and you're going to be a part of it, then everybody here owes something. Everybody here is going to have to pay a price. And that's kind of the crazy thing because we don't find out what that is. Instead, we jump to what I think is actually the coolest part of the story, the man-machine war. And this is awesome. So this place uh, takes place 100 years in the future, right? I mean, hopefully you guys can tell I'm excited about this. This place takes place 100 years into the future. And basically a war is broken out between humanity and mutants. But the difference here is that the, the humanity has allied itself with machines. Now, what this appears to be is kind of like, a, it's almost kind of like the Days of Future Past film kind of being rolled into the comic book form. Not in the exact way, right? It's a lot more extreme here. And really the indication as it was put off by Days of Future Past in the movie was that humans were working with the Sentinels, but really more because it was like, if you don't, we're going to eradicate you, right? So it was more of an undesirable alliance between these two groups. And this, it really looks like they're actually working in a peaceful coexistence with each other. And of course, what they're doing, you know, what, what really seems to have happened here is that, that these mutants have basically gotten their hands on something in particular. Now, what I also want you to take note of is one of these characters here that has a black brain. And we'll kind of follow up with that here in a second and find out what's going on. But of course, she's immediately captured by a combination of uh, really the forces of like these massive sentinels and also with these super advanced artificial uh, artificial intelligence robots. Now, what you also have here is a young girl who looks like she's uh, like the daughter of like Nightcrawler and uh, Magic. And then somebody who also kind of looks like a spinoff version of Nightcrawler, right? So like the, these two people look like they're descended from Nightcrawler himself. And it's kind of weird in terms of how their physical depiction uh, comes out here. But the way this is being done is that this, this particular mutant with the black brain is essentially being taken by humanity, right? I mean, like, you know, her chance of escape is virtually non-existent. Uh, but the idea is that with this young boy here, this, this red skin mutant guy, he doesn't really want to fight. He follows very much in line with Nightcrawler where he's like, I'm really more of a, of a peaceful guy. But this kid is really more of like a priest. He really follows a strong religion and truly believes in the act of pacifism. And so where you end up having, you know, this, this young girl who's addressed as being Rasputin, which we'll talk about that here in a second. But when she's addressed as Rasputin and she basically jumps in, destroys one of the machines and then tries to rescue this woman with a black brain, ultimately it doesn't work out. Instead, this young girl is taken away by the Sentinels and, and Rasputin is essentially just kind of left to survive as best she can. And that's when we start to get into what's going on here. And so what we end up finding out is that somewhere between the present day and 100 years in the future, that the villain Mr. Sinister became an ally or at least seemed to become an ally of the mutant population. Now, the reason why this is important is because for those of you guys who don't know, Mr. Sinister is a guy named Nathaniel Essex, right? At one point in time, he was a human, but he was obsessed with the idea that the human genealogy was predicated on change, that somewhere along the line, the genes of humans were modified, and they were. He was correct about that, but he didn't really have the evidence to prove it. He didn't really know exactly how it had happened. Of course, we know it was due to the Celestials, but the result is that he believed that somewhere along the line that whatever these genes were would begin to manifest and people would begin to develop powers, and he simply called them mutants. Now, eventually, the villain Apocalypse approached Nathaniel Essex after learning about his, his discussions and his, his topics and research and so on, and Nathaniel Essex basically revealed to Apocalypse that he was a mutant, which was the first time that Apocalypse realized what he was. And so following that, Apocalypse basically used his technology to turn Nathaniel Essex into Mr. Sinister and give him an insanely long life, if not full-on immortality. And so ever since then, Nathaniel Essex has always been toying with the idea of messing with, or with, with mutant genes and seeing if he could just create more powerful characters, right? I mean, mutants have always just kind of been an experiment for him. Now, because of the story, The Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix, uh, we ended up finding out the reason why it is a Sinister was so obsessed with creating a child based on the genes of Cyclops and, and Jean Grey. And we'll find, we'll talk about more, you know, talk about that more in like a different video or something like that. But at the moment, what seems to have happened here is sometime between this 100 year window, the present day and 100 years from now, that Sinister began the purpose when this war broke out. He began basically genetically modifying mutants. And so what he would do is he would take a mutant or, or, or he would like build a, a mutant from scratch and he would give them the genes of like multiple characters. And so for this character, Ra uh, Rasputin, she basically has the telepathy of Quentin Quire, who's an Omega level telepath. She's got the powers of Mikhail Rasputin, who's the brother of Colossus, and he can basically manipulate energy. The powers of Kitty 
pride to phase through objects. She's got the healing factor of Laura Kenny. She's literally like a one-stop shop. Now, the way this worked is that you basically had like generations one, two, three, and four. And as these generations went on, the likelihood of survival for these generations began to drop off in the sense that like there was more of a chance of destruction here. Now, what the mutants began to realize over time is that none of this was really being done by Sinister for the purpose of helping mutant kind. It was being done by Sinister for his own goals, his own nefarious purposes. And so eventually what, what seems to have happened here is Sinister was working for the purpose of developing kind of like this perfect mutant more or less. And when that happened, he would hand it over to humanity for whatever that reason happened to be, right? Most likely because humanity had promised him the ability to experiment on mutants as much as he wanted to when they were captured and so on and so forth. What ended up happening is that when Sinister defected to the human side, he was publicly executed. We don't really know the, the explicit details of this. You know, we just kind of know the project side of what Sinister is doing, or at least he was doing. And then most likely we'll find an answer to that later on down the line. But that kind of begs the question, if humans and mutants are working together, then who's running the show here? And that's when we get an answer to the question that the show is being ran by two people. The first is an evolved human who, who basically is, is going by the name Omega. And the second is Nimrod. And that's the coolest thing because Nimrod is a character that we have not seen for a long, long time. For those of you guys who don't know, Nimrod hails from Days of Future Past, right? So the idea was that Sentinels had taken over North America during Days of Future Past. And they basically, you know, they, they captured all mutants they could find everywhere. And even humans were thrown into internment camps. But what the Sentinels were working on was a perfect version of themselves, a perfect, a perfect Sentinel. But what seems to have happened here is that Nimrod has been created yet again. The difference is that this version of Nimrod does not appear to be like the, like the one that we're normally used to, right? Like the traditional version of Nimrod is pretty screwed up. Like he's pretty dark and pretty sadistic. We can assume this is the same version and just kind of evolved, or it's a new version. We don't really have any answers to that question yet. You know, we're just kind of left to sort of make our own guess and, and just kind of go from there. But with these humans showing up with this black brain mutant, who's now known as Sila Bell, what we learn is that they've gone through all kinds of like torturous systems in order to get the information out of her in terms of what Rasputin and these other mutants were after. And where she refused to reveal this information, what Nimrod basically says is like, what they're going to do is they're going to take her and they're going to give her what's called a bath. And the reason why they call it that is because they're going to essentially put her in a tank where she's going to be broken down, not, not really broken down in terms of physical form, but where nanites are essentially going to enter and take over her body. And all the information that she has is going to essentially become a part of the Nimrod mainframe. And that is to say like the machine mainframe and all that information will be readily available. And it's kind of a crazy scenario because, you know, Sila Bell initially kind of tries to put off this air of like, I'm not afraid. I'm not worried about this. And if you think threatening me is really going to cause problems for me, you have no idea what I'm really about. But ultimately none of it matters because when she gets dunked into this tank, the nanites do their work and she's a shell of her former self, just like that. She's essentially gone. It's a death that she can't really escape from, right? I mean, she's kind of stuck there for, for essentially all time. And that's kind of the crazy thing is because all the information she has is going to be extracted. All the information she has is going to be taken away, but her physical form is not going to be destroyed. She's just going to kind of be left there. Now, the indication here is that in terms of her consciousness and her sentience, it's still there. She's just kind of in a catatonic state, but also kind of seemingly aware of what's going on. I know it seems like a contradiction, but that seems to be the way these systems work, right? I mean, she's just kind of taken over and that's the end of her. But one of the things that needs to be pointed out here is that Sila Bell was actually what's called a hound. Now, Jonathan Hickman is not making this up. This is actually something that existed from the events of Days of Future Past and even to a degree, the Age of Apocalypse. So the way this worked, when you come out of Days of Future Past and you kind of look at that scenario, one of the questions a lot of people had is, well, why didn't mutants just go underground? How is it the Sentinels were finding them? And the Sentinels were doing that by using hounds. They were using mutants to hunt other mutants. And that's the way this played out here. It was the creation of hounds designed to track down other mutants. Now, this seems to be an indication of like what Sinister was doing when he defected from, hum uh, from mutant kind and then went over to humanity was presumably creating hounds. There's no reason to believe that's entirely the case, but that kind of seems to be the case. The issue with this is that by the time, you know, with the, the, the first wave, right? Like the first, the first generation of hounds that were created, they were designed for the purpose to elicit sympathy from, from mutant kind. The issue with this is that they weren't really effective hunters because they were designed to be more, more kind and more base in terms of their function, right? So following this came the second generation of hounds and the second generation of hounds were designed to basically insert themselves into mutant encampments and then basically like wipe them all out. The issue with this is, as Jonathan Hickman tells us, because they were based on being on the design of being duplicitous, right? Like the design of basically betrayal. Ultimately, they betrayed humans and machines and joined the mutant population, right? So it's very similar to the concept of like Terminator, the, the, the idea that they were basically taking like human skin and sweat and hair and blood and all that kind of stuff and grafting it over a uh, robot skeleton and then sending them in to infiltrate. That really kind of seems to be what's going on here with those particular folks. And so again, what we do is we pick up with Rasputin and uh, this young guy in tail and basically show up with like what's left of the mutant population. And what you have here is you have what looks like Groot, Wolverine, and then you have, I think it's Zorn or Zian. I'm not, I'm always confused 
confused on which one it is. And then you've got somebody who looks like Magneto. Now, this is something that I want to draw your attention to, especially when it comes to Magneto. There's no indication that it's actually him, especially if we're dealing with what's basically a hundred years into the future. Magneto's powerful, but he's not really powerful enough to like, you know, slow his own aging. And so because of the fact that the costume is different, the indication seems to be that like, it's a wholly different form of his character, right? Like it's somebody else who's taken over the role, perhaps like another, like another son that he had, because we know Polaris has the ability to manipulate magnetism. But again, this is obviously not a woman. And so it's interesting here because what we end up learning is that 100 years in the future, after this war broke out, mutant kind took off to two different locations. One of the locations uh, went out to what's called the Shi'ar Empire. Now the Shi'ar Empire is basically a, a massive empire that exists out there. It's an amalgamation of different races, all swearing allegiance to the magister or magistrix, but they've also had a lot of dealings with the mutant population specifically, as well as earthlings. And so the notion here is that because of the relationship between Charles Xavier and Lalandra, who is a, who was at one point the magistrix or the queen or, or whatever you want to call it of the Shi'ar Empire, that relationships have always been maintained between mutants and the empire itself. And so the result was that they basically offered safe haven. And so of the 10,000 surviving mutants who were left on earth, 8,000 live with the Shi'ar. The other 2,000 actually end up living on the Shi'ar homeworld. Now, the 8,000 are kind of like on an orbiting satellite that kind of exists out there, but the other 2,000 are the most powerful of them. And they're basically those individuals who can be picked and chosen by the Shi'ar to join the Imperial Guard, the most powerful fighting force in the entirety of the universe. So again, there's, there's kind of a lot that goes on there. For those mutants who exist now, who basically kind of reside within the population of Earth, uh, there's only eight of them left. That's really it. There's only eight mutants remaining on Earth during the events of the Man-Machine War. And so what we end up doing is picking up 1,000 years into the future. Now in this future, uh, the scenario is pretty interesting in terms of how it's played out. And the reason why is because of course, again, you know, Silo Bell is still there, uh, but what this also shows is that mutants seemingly have won the man-machine war. Mutants essentially took over everything, or at the very least, humanity evolved in the mutants, and now everybody's a mutant around the world. But the other thing that's kind of given to us here is that humans are still around, right? Like humans still exist. Homo sapiens are still there, but they're really kept more like zoo animals. The entire world, you know, or at least this section is now called the preserve, right? And they call it that because like a nature preserve or an animal preserve, humans are kept there. They're, they're monitored. They're, they're, you know, really just sort of left to run around in this small little area and everything else has been taken over. Nimrod has kind of evolved now to where he's a small little floating machine, more or less. And this person, whoever this person is, we're not really given a name or anything like that, seems to be a mutant of sorts or at the very least evolved into something else. We're not entirely sure, but it looks as though mutants have basically achieved ascension. The mutants have taken over everything uh, and they've achieved their highest level of development, more or less. And so it's kind of crazy because the war is now over. Everything is done and mutants seem to have won it all. But again, this is only issue number one. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered here. There's a lot of questions that we got to figure out and we don't know. Like we don't know the answers to these questions. And in reality, we won't find out until all 12 issues are done, right? Until House of X, the six issue House of X series is done and the six issues Power of X series is done. We won't know until all those are finished what the answers to these things are. But I am very, very excited to find out. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.